Okay, good good morning everybody. Wow, you actually all showed up and brought your children and families. Well, I'm really excited guys today to welcome uh, a very dear friend of mine, colleague, mentor, author, thinker, visionary, a uh, person who has done an extraordinary service to not just this nation, but worldwide, uh, Dr. Michael Maccabee, who was a student and sees work with everyone great. Uh, I know you love reading Dr. Deming's works. Uh, uh, Dr. Deming worked with uh, Dr. Maccabee. Uh, he worked with Russ Akov. He received his, uh, he was, his mentor was uh, Eric Fromm. He's extraordinary, well educated. And all of the books that you are reading, by the way, blame Dr. Maccabee. He told me that you, that you have to read Machiavelli, so I just put it on the syllabus. So if you want any displeasure, <laughs> please uh, com complain to the author. Uh, Dr. Maccabee has uh, consulted uh, internationally. Uh, he worked at, uh, consulted with Google, IBM, numerous company was invited uh, to Sweden to work with Volvo. Uh, Swedish people like him very much. They almost uh, canceled his passport and gave him the, uh, the knighthood in Sweden and let him go back. I, it's part of the joke, but he is a <laughs> <laughs> uh, So I don't know how to call it. Knight, uh, Dr. Michael McAvoy. But um, so. he works with, in Oxford. He's a, at the Oxford Business School. And uh, I'm, works with Harvard, works with major universities. And I'm really proud. He is a Washingtonian, a uh, long time Washingtonian. And what he does in his uh, free time, he's never said no. He always comes and supports public education in the District of Columbia and really supports the uh, University of the District of Columbia and our business school. And it's the third time, uh, come, uh, please come on in. Hello. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the Dr. Dean Reed, come, welcome please come in, welcome. Welcome, Professor. Good to see you again. Uh, please, Dr. Goyer. Really honored to have you. Hello. I'm Melba uh, Reed, a pleasure. Yes. Uh, we really appreciate you coming uh, every once in a while to uh, speak to our students. It's a real pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for coming. And what Dr. Maccabee does, he supports us. He wants you to succeed. It's a third, his third time on campus. The first time he came, uh, we had a, uh, I don't know how many, it, 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 those of you who were here 10 years ago, we were in some closet That's building under construction. Uh, today we're in a brand new school of business where everything works, including the air conditioner. Uh, we are the best equipped school of business in the whole Washington DC metropolitan area, the only one with smart boards, smart rooms. And my hope is um, that when Dr. Markeby comes back in two years, we have a fully functional doctoral program and we're going to call it a narcissistic doctoral program in this area. Uh, Dr. Maccabee is an author of uh, 14 books. Uh, he is uh, uh, working right now on his latest book called Strategic Intelligence, the topic that we discussed on Monday. And I'll ask Dr. Maccabee to talk a little bit about his, uh, his works. And one of the key uh, notes, uh, I just came from Dr. Mac Maccabee's house. When you go into his house, he actually doesn't have walls. It's all covered in books. And I took a few pictures. I want to show it to you about the thinkers and how they read books. And he's also a disciplined person. Uh, he wakes up in the every morning, walks on his walk, uh, consults, and does a lot of uh, great things. And so with this, uh, Dr. Michael, thank you for uh, choosing our school to come to our school in lieu of other commitments that you have. And please share your ideas with uh, students who have lots of uh, questions to you. Thank you. Well, I think I, I think I may know you uh, as well as you know me since, since I have your first <laughs> profile. <laughs> um, and this is it's very interesting about um, 26 of you sent in. How many here sent took the question? Almost all of you. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's a mix. You have a mix of personalities here. But uh, the most dominant group 
here are people whose personality is mainly idealistic and caring. Mm -hmm. This is a very caring group of people. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, I don't know how you like what you prefer. I, uh, if you have questions, we could go there. If you'd like me to just give a brief view of my latest book and strategic intelligence and how that connects to other work, including uh, Dr. Deming's work, I could start there. Would you like me to do that? Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, th this new book is called uh, Strategic Intelligence conceptual tools for leading change. And uh, you know, change is constant today. Anybody in any organization is constantly dealing with, with change that's forced on us by changing nature of competition, changing nature of technology. For example, I was working with a large company that had lots of little organizations around the country, and they brought in the a new technology that connected everyone, uh, SAP technology, forced a huge change in the way they worked. And even in, in, a, in every, people could do things um, with, with IT that before they had to go and meet people to do. In other words, you can see everywhere change is a constant. Now, what I found is the way it's mostly taught in business schools and academic is to give people a roadmap. You start out with the top, and then you do this, you get people involved, et cetera, et cetera. But what I've seen is there's no roadmap. There's so many different reasons for change that uh, I don't see any kind of roadmap or, or uh, steps It's going to work in every case. So, but what I do see is there are qualities of mind and heart that are necessary for people who are leading change. Then they can make their own roadmap. And this is what I see in terms of strategic intelligence. Get rid of this. <laughs> Let's see. The these are the elements of strategic intelligence. First of all, foresight. People have to be aware of what the trends are. What's coming that could hurt you or help you? What are the threats? What are the opportunities? Once you see that, then you can begin to think about what kind of organization do you need? Visioning. Visioning is taking what you have and, and saying, okay, if we're going to have a, if new products, how do we have to change our organization? I worked with a large organization. <clears throat> All of its products were becoming commodities. They were losing, the margins were disappearing, and uh, they said, what can we do? So I said, let's talk to our major customers. This is a company that made products for electrical engineering. And the uh, customers began to say, look, if you really want more business with us, we don't need products. The largest, this, was, this company was in Canada. And one, and one of their customers was the largest zinc producing company in the world in Western Canada. They said, we don't need another power transformer. What we need is cleaner, cheaper energy. If you can give us cleaner, cheaper energy, then we'll work with you interactively. We won't have to just compete on selling a product. You see what I mean? Yes. yes. But to do that changes your whole organization. You don't just go out selling things and taking people to hockey games and dinners mm -hmm. to sell and so on. You've got to really understand that. You've got to really work interactively. It changes the whole thing. Third, you have to be able to partner. This is a 
is crucial. Partnering is absolutely essential. Not only with, your, with key customers, but internally. Because one of the things I've found is that in large companies today, there isn't one kind of leader. This is a mistake a lot of, I think a lot of people make. They start arguing about what, how do you define leadership. But there isn't one kind of leader. If you look at major companies, <coughs> they have strategic leaders for thinking about these things. They have operational leaders. People are making the processes, making, managing the data, making sure things are working. And then they have networking leaders. People can bring people together so that you can uh, see sometimes if you're going to really work on a solution like this company or like companies like IBM, you need networking leaders who bring together the hardware, the software, the consulting into a team and create a team. Crucial. And finally, here you need to be able to motivate people to make it happen. And keep learning. Now, okay, how did, what, are, what are the kinds of qualities are needed to do this? Well, one thing you need is to have a clear philosophy. It's important for everything. You have to have a clear sense of what's your organization's purpose. What are the values that are essential to serve that purpose? What are you measuring? How do you make moral and ethical decisions? These are all part of a organizational philosophy that's absolutely essential in all these things. For example, if I don't have a clear philosophy, how do I know who, to, who I can trust, who I can partner with, who shares my philosophy? Second of all, you need what Deming called profound knowledge. And that includes that includes knowledge of systems. One of the main problems of vision visioning people sometimes have they don't understand the system. The uh, when uh, a system is a set of qualities or components that has a purpose and the parts have to work together. They have to interact to achieve that purpose. You can't evaluate any part by itself, but only in terms of how well it interacts with the others to serve that purpose. And there are three kinds, basic three kinds of systems. One is a mechanical system, like a car. So for, and you can design that. But think of you know, Russell Aikoff, who was a great thinker about systems, used to say, if we got together and said, let's get the best automobile parts in the world, and you got uh, a Mercedes engine, and you got a Lexus drivetrain, somebody else got a Ferrari braking system, and we brought it all together, what would we have? What do we have? A, a mess. A mess. A mess. And yet, when HP bought Compaq, you know what they said to their managers? Find the best elements of each company and bring it together. And you know what they had? A mess. A mess. A mess. Because they weren't thinking systemic. And lots of people I've seen in companies, it's the greatest weakness is they don't think systemic. So the first kind is a mechanical system. The second kind is an organic system, your body. Each of your parts of your body can't, can't be evaluated independently, but how well it serves the purpose 
of the system, which is life. Now that, that's determined genetically. Up to now. We don't know whether in the future it's going to also be mechanical. <laughs> and, but the third kind of system, which is the kind of system we're dealing with, is a social system. And a, in a social system, key parts of the system have purposes of their own. Those are the people, us. We all have our own purposes. And so, to create a common purpose, what do you need to create a common purpose in an organization? You need a common cause. Hmm? A cause. Common unity. One, one yeah, but how do you get that? Um, Socialize. Working together. Hmm? Building relationships. Yeah. Building relationships, working together. Um, well, that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. And you need leadership who can articulate and also practice a clear philosophy. People are not going to work for the common purpose unless they feel that the organization's purpose makes sense to them. And the values protect them and their interests, as well as the customer. Some people want to be in companies where the purpose also includes a uh, making life better for other people. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think a lot of you who are caring people mm -hmm. might mm -hmm. be much more likely to be motivated. Mm -hmm. If you were an organization where you were convinced it was helping people <coughs> right. and making their lives better, you'd be more motivated. Mm -hmm. So, uh, systems, <coughs> systems thinking is one part of profound knowledge. Second is knowledge of variation, crucial. Many times when people make mistakes in companies, they're blamed for it when it was really the process called attribution error. And it's very important for people to understand statistics, but also understand when something, when a mistake is due to a special cause, that might be an individual's mistake, or a common cause, which is that the process is bad. I was working with a uh, automobile parts company who made parts for Lexus, Mercedes, and Cadillac, all very expensive luxury cars. And I asked the chief engineer, is there any difference in the way you're treated by these different companies, their customers? He said, yes. When we have a mistake, the Mercedes and GM say, fix it quickly, even if you cost more, you have to work around. So. They act like it's a special cause. Lexus, Toyota, comes in and says, let's look at the system, see whether there's a common cause, see whether the process is not working. Mm -hmm. And when they find that, they sometimes help to not only fix the process, but actually becomes more productive. Mm -hmm. That's a big difference, because <clears throat> they understand Deming. That makes sense to you? Yeah. 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 Third, is the theory of creating knowledge. How, you know, if you have ideas to change a process or a system, how do we know whether it works or not? And Deming used a uh, built on the Schuart cycle. Have you taught that? This, you guys read Deming, right? Yes. yes. We, we have not talked about the cycle. Oh. Yeah. So there are ways, Deming describes ways of testing ideas. Yes. 
another person who's, who's been very, who gave some very good thinking was Chris Ardress mm -hmm. <coughs> on type 1 and type 2 error. Have you studied that? Well, let me just give you quickly. <laughs> Let's say you have a theory. You have a theory. That leads to practice. And that leads to results. <coughs> okay? Mm -hmm. Now let's say the results are not what the theory predicted. Type 1 error. Type 1 error says I'm going to look at my uh, practice. Maybe I didn't do it right. Say the doctor, let's say, let's say a doctor uh, diagnoses that you have a certain kind of problem, prescribes medication, and it doesn't help. Now the doctor may say, well, I've got to change the dosage. They didn't give you enough. Mm -hmm. I've got to give you a little different. That's type one error. Type two error is you question the theory. You know, suppose you were, suppose somebody was a pitcher on a Major League Baseball team. And this batter is coming up. And he's got a theory. Theory is he can't hit a curveball. Okay? Mm -hmm. So he throws a curveball. Guy hits a home run. Now, what would type <coughs> one, what would type one attitude be? What would the reaction be in type one? Change practice. Change of practice. Would say maybe I didn't throw it right. You know, maybe it wasn't a good curve. What's type two? What would type two say? Yeah, maybe this guy's learned how to hit a curveball. Maybe you're wrong. So so but very so much. So, so many times people respond with type 1. They can't change their theory. They don't question the, the doctor doesn't question the diagnosis. So that's another part of creating knowledge. That's good. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> and finally, psychology. motivation. And Dr. Deming, actually, I met Dr. Deming because he read a book of mine called Why Work on motivation and leadership. And he called me and he said, would you, I'd like you to, uh, I'd like you to teach me about this. And he was 90 years old. <laughs> and I would meet him uh, but once a month for about three years. And we would just change discussion, he, and he would take notes, um, and uh, you know, essentially, Dr. Deming believed motivation, to motivate people, you have to connect to their intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic motivation. Have you discussed that? Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> we don't need to hear anything, Dr. Markley. <laughs> so, uh, More holes. If you look at, can I erase all this? Ah, uh, hold on. No, don't erase. I'm going to save it. <laughs> and you can go to the next page. <laughs> so let me just save it. Yeah, you can get another page. Just click on this one. Yeah, yeah. And it shows up. Okay. 
<laughs> the new professor is staying. <laughs> um, let's uh, <clears throat> consider Whether somebody uh, has uh, extrinsic motivation extrinsic motivation is not connecting to your own values and motives but paying you payment, compensation, sorry. <coughs> Carrots and sticks, including threats. Let's look here at intrinsic ones. Now, if you, if you really want people to be fully engaged and motivated, You've got to have both. If they, uh, if you've got extrinsic motivation, but or let's say you've got intrinsic motivation, but um, you don't have extrinsic motivation. Let's say the job is very appealing, but you're not being paid fairly. You, you're going to be resentful, right? <laughs> now let's say you're being paid well, but the job sucks. <laughs> you know, it's boring to it. You're going to be compliant. You go through the motions. You're not going to give any more. Not going to provide any more because it's not, it really doesn't connect. It's not interesting. And uh, if it's neither, you're going to be totally alienated. Disengage. What percentage of the American workforce do you think is up here? Well, it's a little better than you think. It's uh, actually about. 30%. But that's not so great, is it? No. no. <laughs> if you go to uh, some other countries, it's down 10%. This is all based on the Gallup, Gallup survey. So we're really, you know, there's a lot of room here for strategic intelligence. You come, you if if you were if we could really develop this, we could have a much much more productive workforce. Now, a lot of there's still a lot of people think that this is the only thing important. But I was years ago. What turned me off to that thinking? was a series of, an exper of experiments by a professor at the University of Wisconsin, Harry Harlow. Harry Harlow took some monkeys and he gave them a problem to solve. It's kind of opening a door, it's very kind of complicated. And the monkeys took the problem on. They seemed to enjoy solving the problem. Then he, then he gave them bananas if they solved it right. You know what happened? Their performance went down. 
they were thinking about the bananas and not the mom. So people, <coughs> people that are all over in business talk about um, incentive programs for teachers, for example. Now, my mother was a teacher, and I worked for many years at the American Federation of Teachers Union, and I don't think teachers do good work because they're thinking about the money. I think it's insulting. Well, these people think they're going to make teaching better by paying more with, with scores where the students have scores that are higher on tests. I don't see any evidence for it. I think it's just insulting. And, and it's all based on not lack of knowledge, lack of study of what really works. Theories with type one answers. Do you know what, uh, if you really look at what work, what is the key element in making schools function better? Because I've really looked into this and seen a lot of results. It's the quality of the principal. In schools that really work well, the principals protect the teachers, make sure they get coaching, make sure that the kids don't go out of uh, line and, you know, having controlling the classroom is crucial in a good school. All these things depend on good leadership. You know, we look at, we look at the, uh, fin Finland has the highest test scores in the world. <clears throat> People say, well, it's because they, they recruit uh, smarter teachers and so on. But I talked to some of the Finnish um, teachers. And one of the things about Finland is nobody gets to be a principal who has not been proven to be a master teacher first. Mm -hmm. They don't bring in former generals or bureaucrats or business people. Teaching is a craft, and you want a master craftsperson to be the leader who really understands the people, who really understands uh, how to support them and help them. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. Why doesn't anybody get it? <laughs> Why do they keep talking about change, uh, uh, test scores and and giving more money to people get why, why does nobody understand what you can see if you really go out and look at good schools? They're not looking at the money. They're looking at the money. They're looking at the money. They're also looking at the results. And also they want to attack the teachers union. It's not that, I mean, they, they, if you look at my, I wrote a book called The Leap, the leaders we need and what makes us follow. And I have a chapter on, on, on leaders for schools. And I found uh, a number of schools with, with unions, strong unions, who collaborate with strong superintendents and principals who are developed. And that this one like in California, south of LA, um, their test scores are 10% higher than the rest of California. And it's because of leadership and, and partnering, partnering with the union. Well, I think I've talked enough. So let's see if you have any questions. And ask loudly, guys. So, and. Yeah. <coughs> I may not hear, I don't hear so well. So speak okay. loudly. Okay. So um, I know that you're a contributor for the Washington Post, and um, in one of the articles that, in one of the comments you made, you said that um, you know it's better for leaders to be feared than loved. Do you think that that concept still apply today in modern organizations? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> Machiavelli, in The Prince, says it's better for leaders to be feared and love because 
you can control fear and you can't control love. And uh, Machiavelli's view is first, first get control and then you can be loved and you can do nice things for people that love you. So, and the prince. But you know, you have to always look, when people's theories, you have to look at the context. What are they talking about? What are their examples? What have they studied? So, Machiavelli and the Prince was talking about the Renaissance, Italy, where every, nobody could trust anybody, where people were betraying each other, and so on. But Machiavelli also wrote another book. He wrote a book on the commentaries of Livy about Rome, about the, founding, the beginning of the Roman Republic. And when he looks at the Republic, which is very different from the, these principalities of the Renaissance era, he has a very different point of view. He says, here are two generals. One is named Manlius Torquatus, and the other is named Valerius Corvina. And Manlius Torquatus is like General Patton, tough, hard, fear, but a, a disciplinarian. He even had his own son publicly hanged for corruption. Everyone fears him. Valerius Corvanus is more like uh, Eisenhower, more caring about people, listening, um, more loved than feared. So Machiavelli says, which general was more successful? What do you think? The loved one. It turns out that both were more successful. In a republic. In a republic where people have rights, citizens. And he says, what? what's the point? The point is both of them had a clear philosophy. And they practiced it and everyone knew it. And the important thing is not just whether you're loved or feared, but whether you are trusted, whether you have a consistent philosophy that people can trust, that you practice, and everyone understands. Yeah? But do you think you can be both in today's um, organization? About what? Do you think you can be both um, feared and loved in today's organization? Well, one thing is every CEO is somewhat feared, whatever they do. Why? Because they could fire you or they could promote you. <laughs> so they may pretend that you shouldn't, don't fear me, I'm, you know, I'm just one of the guys and so on. But you know the truth. So you can't get away from fear. The question is how much fear? If there's too much fear, it's going to hurt the organization. Correct. Why? Because people won't, they won't communicate truths that will get them into trouble. So you've got to make it clear that if you make a mistake, nobody's going to be punished for a mistake, but it's going to be something for learning. Some years ago, I worked with AT&T. And AT&T had a problem uh, very often that people doing construction or uh, workers by mistake would be digging somewhere and break a cable which would cut off the long distance. And nobody, they'd say, how did this happen? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. you know nobody's going to say, I did it by mistake if they're afraid they're going to be fired or punished. But when the manager is working with said, from now on, what we're going to do any time that there's a cable cut, we're going to make it a learning experience. We're going to find out why. And we're going to develop a process that everyone can understand to uh, put in the information. And this ended up, in the end, improving productivity, making sure there were no cable cuts, making sure that when there was construction that the people in construction knew where the cables were, etc. Change the whole thing. So it's not, you can never get rid of fear, but you can create good processes that limit fear. Now Deming said drive out all fear, but he was a, 
he was an optimist. <coughs> Do you believe that there's a such thing? You talked a lot about narcissism as productive narcissism as opposed to unproductive. Like when you say it, it can push people to be their best and the dreamers or the thinkers, but not be too far out there dreaming. Do you think that that lies, a little bit of that lies within each of us? Because I believe something pushes. We all have a quality that can push something better. In each we have person, all the as opposed I to mean, this. if you look at these <coughs> four types, we all have all of them. We all are caring to some degree. We're all exacting to some degree. We're all narcissistic visionary to some degree. And we're all adaptive to some degree. The question is, what's the dominant element? What, what's the configuration? But everyone has everything. Now, the interesting thing, I mean, you, you've uh, You've read the uh, Productive Narciss Narcissistic mm -hmm. Leaders mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. So you see, what I'm looking at some of these really successful visionary narcissists. And these are people who uh, did not identify with parents in childhood. They, did, they were not programmed like most many people are uh, in terms of what is right or wrong. They developed their own uh, ego ideal. You know, Obama wrote a whole book about it, about looking for his father, and, and how he had, to, he had to develop his own sense of what was important, what his ideal was. He had to create an identity and create a vision. And that's true of all the, these productive narcissists, whether it's Steve Jobs or Frank Lloyd Wright or, yeah. In, in, in your book, um, you had mentioned um, that one with the person out with the narcissist personality type um, he said they are best suited to lead in times of rapid social change and economic change I am one who's um, caring dependent and I wonder and you and you just mentioned that everyone has all four types but with my dominant um, personality type being that of a caring person, would I also be able to um, lead in a rapid social and economic change? Well, I don't know you, yeah. so. <laughs> but Just let's, given that, that dominant of caring dependent. Yeah, but let's, uh, what, do you, what do we find are the weaknesses of caring people? Mm -hmm. uh, vulnerable, very vulnerable. They're vulnerable, they need cut, they want to be appreciated. Very emotional. Um, yeah, they're very emotional. They don't like conflict. Right. Mm -hmm. It's hard for them to tell somebody, you know, you're not needed here. <laughs> they tend to take over too much responsibility for other people, problems. Well, it's very hard to lead case. Very hard to lead case because you're protecting people. And, and if you have changed, there are always winners and losers. Okay. There's a certain toughness involved. Okay. Now, anyone can develop their hearts mm -hmm. to be stronger. Not hard, but strong to make those decisions. But you have to decide, I'm going to go against some of my tendencies okay. for the good of the whole. Okay. I'm going to look at the good of the whole, not the good of this one person. That really requires a lot of work on yourself. Yeah. yeah my name is Jerry McClendon. Um, uh, in reference to strategic intelligence, what I want to know is, does REM sleep play a part in that, right? Does it better it? The what? REM. REM sleep. The REM part of sleep. REM? REM. REM. Oh, like in sleep. sleep. In sleep. Yeah. Does that play a part in, in this? Yeah, strategic intelligence. Now, how, how does it? What do you think? Does it better it or does it? I don't know, actually. Well, I don't either. <laughs> 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 <That's it. clears throat> yeah, there are a lot of people. <laughs> Why don't you call on someone? Oh, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Um, in, your, in the description, I'm not going to probably hear you. Uh, in your, in your speak that up close. And speak loud, guys, if it's a qu in your description of the narcissist, one of the qualities is selfishness. 
Do you feel that uh, selfishness is a byproduct of being successful, or is it a requirement, or is it necessary to become successful? Well, I think every type can be selfish. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're just a, I think one of the problems is we use the term narcissism, as I said, as a, as a conceptual garbage can for all kinds of egoism, selfishness, et cetera. But you can have somebody who's very, not at all narcissistic, very exacting, obsessive, et cetera, but he's very selfish, very obstinate, selfish. Or you can even have a caring person who tends to be selfish and only, uh, only cares about a few people. Know the people about and care about. So uh, I think we need to look at the narcissistic personality as different from, for example, narcissism that we all have or egoism that we all have. I mean, you know, part of um, the Buddhists say that the purpose of life of enlightenment is overcoming egoism and laziness to the point where you're, you don't even have a self anymore. You say, if you see Buddha on the road, kill him. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, that's, a, that's really a spiritual goal to overcome egoism. And, and I mean, Jesus says, love thy, love thy neighbor, love thy enemy. This is really, this is the challenge of, uh, of a great religion. You can't overcome egoism by just not being selfish. You can only overcome it by being loving. Janae, another question? No. Viet, go ahead. Uh, I want to talk a little bit. Loud, Viet, loud. I want to talk about what we discussed in class the other day that um, That's as it. our professor talk about uh, the Narcissus leadership, so they were raised. Now you gotta start here. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about like what we discussed in class the other day. How our professor taught, explained to us how uh, Narcissus leadership. They was raised by um, a strong mother and often absent by the father, which is my case. But um, so I don't see that how is it like really makes sense very much. Cause I don't think. I mean, I was raised by a very strong mother and my father was never there, and I'm not very sure that I'm a, I'm a selfish person. I mean, I'm, so I just want maybe you go to no, the different you know, I, I don't even say you'd be a selfish person. I would say you have a challenge. You don't have a father there to identify with, to copy. So you've got to create your own sense of who you want to be. What kind of men are really represent what you want to be? Now, you could be really grandiose, and you would say, I want to be Abraham Lincoln. That's what, that's what Obama, in effect, said. I want to be like Abraham Lincoln. Or you can say, I want to be like my grandfather, my mother's father. I mean, it, it, but that's a challenge. What, what's your ego ideal want to be? What is it? What 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 are you kind of striving for? Because all of us have an ego ideal, but many boys with strong fathers have an ego ideal, which is basically what their father's attitude. If you look at R. G. the third, he's got a very strong father, so he's got a very strong father. Attitude. That's true of many athletes. It's true of. Uh, to Tiger Woods, for example, a very strong father who grew up with, who he copied, who he wanted to live up to. Uh, but if you don't have that kind of father, you've got to create your own sense of who you want to be, who do you want to live up to. And sometimes it, people without a strong, men without a strong father fail, so they start to just want to be like the gang. And that's why gangs become so powerful, because they play that role for it. We're going to be like the leader of the gang. We're going to, we don't need fathers. <laughs> so I want to put on some fake now. Um, 
the, in the in the present time uh, nowadays that most employer they are look, when they when they looking for hiring people they're looking for maybe looking at your background education education background so um, so for example if if you go to a university which they're not looking for specifically or anything like that they may not hire you or put you on the list so so my question is uh, where is our ed education direction going like where is our direction in education where would be like until what day what time that in lawyer will stop looking at your education background and start giving you a change to, to a better job a better position well i think i think the best companies <coughs> organizations are looking at your skills and qualities i think the first question <coughs> is how are you able to solve problems? Are you able to relate well to other people? Are you able to write a good uh, report? If you can really show these kinds of qualities, I, I think people are less interested in where you come from. No. Um, according to your background, uh, you studied with from and uh, which of course he also adapted uh, Simon Ford theory. Okay, Simon Ford talk about uh, uh, psychosexual. At what age does a child develop psychosexual stage and when does it mature? And if it's mature, are there another theories that uh, determine another stage of that? Well, you know, Freud, <clears throat> I don't think Freud's theories have held up from that point of view. For example, Freudians all thought that homosexuality was due to early childhood experience of like not identifying with the same sex person and so on. But what we've seen is it's much more uh, genetic. Studies have really shown that homosexuality is not due to the family experience of growing up. It's mainly due to your genes. So, uh, yeah. And also, uh, on that, he also talked about fixation. He said that uh, within those stage, uh, um, got fixated. Yeah, uh, uh, the laborer will uh, permanently invest in uh, each one of those stage uh, um, of the psychosexual. Can you please elaborate? Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's really held up. I don't think that really, I mean, he would say somebody who's who is erotic caring is fixated on the oral receptive early stage. Well, somebody who is much more obsessive, exacting, is fixated on the anal stage. In his first, uh, <coughs> Freud's first study of character was called the, was on the, the anal character. He said people who, uh, at a certain stage in life, you get sexual pleasure from anal stimulation, no. but that, that the uh, people <laughs> develop a uh, <clears throat> reaction formation to this. So they become super clean, orderly, obstinate. And that was in the question. The question was on the childhood development. And he also, and like I said, he said that uh, you can permanently invest uh, and uh, the person can uh, uh, copy some of those characteristics that uh, refer to their emphasis uh, of their childhood. Yeah, well, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, Janae? Yeah. Um, okay. I was reading... Um, Janae, loud. I was reading a book review um, on your um, book, Narcissistic Leaders, Who Succeeds and fail, Who Fails. Question. Um, and it mentioned um, that one of the five things suggested in your book was to, in order to work functionally with a narcissistic leader, is to protect the narcissist image. And I was wondering how do you go about doing that without further fueling, um, as you pointed out, um, the expansion of like grandiosity and things of that nature to where it becomes destructive? <laughs> well, how do you do that? It's very difficult. To, but the, these narcissistic leaders see their, particularly if they're in an organization, they see their image as essential for the whole organization. 
Well, I mean, that's tr obviously true. Obama's popularity is crucial for the whole Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. So uh, how does he, how would he have been able to strengthen his image without becoming more grandiose? Very difficult. <laughs> I, I'm not sure how. Other than uh, to have around him people that he trusts who tell him, you know, get off it. First of all, a, very, a man like that needs a very strong wife. He has a very strong wife. That helps. You know, she's going to say, you know, uh, as Michelle Obama said when he was running for president, that his socks are smelly. You know? <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, that's one thing, to have people around you. What about, because um, there have been some experiences that I've had where people have had, haven't had that, and they were not in position to where they put themselves in, um, I guess, situations to build relationships of that nature to where they can have people. Like, they, they, they were so involved in themselves yeah, at that point. Yeah, I know. Point well, they, get, just they like, get into big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as I point out in the book, how many of them have failed, crashed? Mm -hmm. Look at Napoleon. Napoleon was doing very well until he, was start, he wanted to go into Russia, and Talleyrand, who was his minister of foreign affairs, who kept him in reality, said, you're nuts to try to go into Russia. He said, you're fired. And that's, that's the experience when you attempt to do that, it's like, okay, you don't know what you're talking about. Shut up. Get away from me. I don't talk to you yeah. anymore. And it's like, how do you navigate around? Well, if you, if you don't, you're, you're going to be in bad trouble. Okay. Pick someone. Not this. Hello. Loud. Hello. Good afternoon, our camera person. I wanted to know uh, how has, because you've been uh, in the leadership business for a really long time, and how has um, leaders' perceptions of themselves changed, and how also people perceive leaders, how has that changed over the years, and do you think that it will drastically change in the future with technology and everything and how the world is coming together, like for the future, maybe 20 years down the line? How do you uh, guesstimate that that will change? Like, how do you predict that? Um, the way leaders are perceived will change, and how they, how they, um, with their perception of themselves, how will that change in the future? Do you think? Simple question. <laughs> well, I brought a book about this called "The Leaders We Need." Um, <clears throat> it's been changing. If I go back to when I started working, the leaders uh, tended to be father figures. Okay. They're not anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they can't get away. People, can't, people don't want father figures. Right. Mm -hmm. And they, um, sometimes they, they, they want mother figures. I was talking to one woman who was a CEO of a company <coughs> who said to me, uh, you know, I have a problem with some of my people. They think I should be like their mother. I have to tell them I'm not your mother. I could maybe I could be your friend, but um, what we're seeing more <clears throat> more and more is people see leaders from a point of view of what are you doing for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. The same way little kids see their parents. Mm -hmm. So twenty years down the line, like do do you think it's going to remain constant on that? It depends on what happens. If we have a real crisis, people are going to want a very strong leader. If we don't have a, that kind of crisis, mm -hmm. we're going to want leaders who are much more um, interactive, create leadership teams, have much more delegation, much more listening to other people, and so on. Eric? Dr. McAfee. Um, in today's organizations, we're now seeing CEOs and leaders of companies um, starting out in their early 20s and early, mid 20s and early 30s. Um, what do you feel as though would be um, 
the factor that allows them to stay in that position because you have to know yourself, as you said, in order to have a personality to run the company. So do you feel as though that, let's say for example, the CEO of Burger King is in a qualified position to be a leader, to lead a company into the next wave um, in that organization? Or should it be tenure to those that have experience and know who they are as a leader? I think it depends on their strategic intelligence. Can they partner? If you look at uh, Mark Zuckerberg of mm -hmm. face, Facebook, he was having trouble till he brought in, uh, what's her name, Sharon? Um, Steinberg? Yeah. Stem, yeah, Steinberg. To be his chief operating officer because he can't deal with people very well. He's just up in the clouds and strategizing and so on. So he brings in a very strong woman as the operations to run the company and it's going very well. When Steve Jobs first was CEO of uh, Apple, he was very young and he tried to run everything by himself and he was very uh, dictatorial and he was fired. He came back, he learned he needed to partner with Tim Cook, who was good at operations and processes, Joni Ives, who was good at design, and Apple became a great company. So it really has to do with the elements of strategic intelligence. Ahmad? Um, oh. From what I've, what I've read about you and heard about you, it seems that you seem to be a purist when it comes to learning. I do you, do you, what? Do you, um, it seems that you're a purist when it comes to learning, reading, adapting on your own. Do you feel that technology and its uses diminishes the level of intelligence in the next generation? No. Uh, you mean artificial intelligence? No, I mean like the internet and the, like people drawing conclusions from others. Well, you know, the internet has already increased our knowledge tremendously. And we can look up things immediately that we couldn't do before. But that's information. And you've got to make a distinction here. I'm going to show you something. Something that Russell Lake talked about. Oh. I'm going to take this. We have down here data. That's uh, all kinds of bits and bytes and so on. But that only becomes information when there is some kind of measuring system. In other words, you, you may have a uh, a hundred. Well, that's nothing unless you, you're talking about a thermometer, some kind of system that tells you, you know, this has some kind of meaning. But uh, we are overwhelmed by information. We need to know the meaning of it. So, for example, let's say somebody, uh, a doctor comes, takes your temperature, and it's 100. So what? He has to know whether, was it, if, it, if, it, if yesterday it was 98, and now it's 100, that may be a problem. But if yesterday it was 102, and now it's 100, it may be a good sign, getting better. So information by itself doesn't tell you the meaning of the information. Often people say, we need to give people more information. No, we need to give people more understanding. But then, understanding is not enough. You have to have knowledge. In other words, how to, how to use this information. It's no good for a doctor to have the information who doesn't know what to do about it. So we need knowledge. And uh, beyond knowledge, we get wisdom. 
seldom get it. We don't use it. We often don't get it. There are two, two definitions of wisdom. One is having an understanding of the long-term implications of the decisions you make now, the knowledge you use now. <clears throat> One. So for example, I mean somebody may say, well, uh, we've got to, to meet our goals and meet our, our uh, commitments. We've got to fire so many people. But somebody with wisdom might say, look, I see an upturn in business. There's going to be a big change. We're going to need those people in a year. And we're going to have to hire them and train them and so on. And in the long run, we're going to lose money by making this short-term decision. That's one way of looking at wisdom. Another way of looking at wisdom is not just intellectually, but also emotions from the heart. There, if you go back to the Bible, the story of King Solomon. King Solomon has a dream, mm -hmm. Ram. <laughs> and uh, in the dream, God says, what can I give you? And so Solomon says, a heart that listens. A heart that listens. That's the basis of his wisdom. So that wisdom is, cannot be just intellectual. It can be also head and heart. And that's a whole other story of developing not only our intellect, but our hearts. And I don't think a machine can, or a technology can do that. We're, we're, kind, we're over time. Right? Yeah. Oh, well, fine. Yeah. Uh, we have, if you, if you want one more question, then. One more question. One more question. And very short. Uh, and okay. um, you loud, loud, loud and brief. <laughs> and Alicia, very brief. Yeah, just I'll, I'll keep it brief, Dr. McAdoo, but in the beginning you talked about foresight. Um, in terms of the conductive narcissist and in addition to strategic intelligence, you talked about what are threats and what are opportunities and the person realizing what are the threats and what are the opportunities. How often do you take the gamble and risk no. it all, Sorry. realizing that Duff. it threats to you and possibly others, but a bigger opportunity awaiting you. Is it 100% narcissist that will always take the gamble, or can a productive nar narcissist realize when an opportunity... Guys, short questions. Well, you know, the best <laughs> ones I know are uh, take risk, but they're not crazy. They don't... They don't I'll listen, what's make your sure the odds are pretty good. So the question is, if you're taking a risk, you have to look at also the downside. What, given the what happens if it fails? Is it worth the risk? Can I have a, a, a net? What's the question? So it's, a, it's always a question of weighing the options. And, uh, so somebody who, who is a narcissist is more likely to do that to achieve their vision, they have a possibility of achieving their vision. I, one of the people I worked with, Sidney Harmon, he, uh, when he created Harmon, Card and Hi-Fi, so on, he mortgaged his house. He paid his house. And he was highly successful. Okay, I think okay. that... Okay, unless anybody has something, a great three-word question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last question, Derek. Yeah, that's... What, what do the scores mean? What do the scores mean? What's the, what's the other last question? Oh, what do the scores mean? Oh, what about the scores? Yes. What um, is it? Well, the scores give you a sense of the combination. Uh, as, uh, what is your name? Monica. Monica. Monica pointed out, we have all of these elements.
So if you look at that score, you'll see which one is dominant and how dominant. Some people it's almost balanced. You know, they kind of balanced between a couple. Could go either way depending on the situation. And others are very strongly, you can see very strongly, say, if you had really, if, let, let, show me one. Okay. So you're, your um, dominant is adaptive. So you would say in a dominant, dominant way, um, you are the kind of person who very, uh, has kind of radar where people are, what's going, what you need to do to succeed, right? But you're also, you also have strong caring elements. So you see both of both of them. Somebody else can hear me. Are they hearing? Oh. No, sorry. Yeah, this one. Thank you. This one is really balanced between missionary and caring. So you would say you're the kind of person who would you would like to create something that really helps people. You'd like to be part of creating some kind of vision that really makes life better for some people. Oh. I worked with an American mm -hmm. priest in Mexico 50, 50 years ago when I was in Mexico. And he had that kind of personality. And he, he, was, uh, he went to Mexico because I would not ordain him in Arizona because he was sickly. And he went to Mexico where he was teaching English language school. But the bishop of Cuernavaca uh, ordained him and gave him a little parish in the marketplace. And one day the, the poor box was robbed. And uh, the little boy had been taken to prison. And he went to the prison and said to the warden, well, I don't want to prefer charges. Let him go. The warden says, but Father, this little boy is an orphan. He's going to be back on the street. So Father Watson said, I'll take him home. The next day the warden came. I've got 10 more for you. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're in nine countries. With thousands of children have been developed. Nine countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. We have a hospital in Haiti that's treat, pediatric hospital treated 100,000 children. Um, five of the nine countries are run by orphans who've grown up and had university. Mm -hmm. The CEO is a, was an orphan who has an MBA. Mm -hmm. And I talk with him every other week and we're coaching him and so on. So that's, that's somebody who's caring and visionary, right? Mm -hmm. That would appeal to you, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> Fresh, <laughs> kids. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> this one, who is Janet? Janet. 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 But you're, you're dominant, uh, also your dominance is caring. Um, but, and you, you have a st strong, also similar strong visionary side to you. Not, not quite as strong as hers, but still strong. You're, you're a kind of person also who would be enthusiastic about some kind of organization that really helped people and really care for others. Okay? Well, well, thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, thank you guys thank for participating. You. And, uh, thank you for bringing us. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Buy one up a donut. I'm gonna eat them all. I'm gonna eat them all. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>